Welcome to What the F is Going On in Latin America, Code Pink's weekly YouTube program of hot news out of Latin America and the Caribbean. In partnership with Friends of Latin America and Task Force on the Americas, we broadcast every Wednesday at 4.30 p.m. Pacific, 7.30 p.m. Eastern on Code Pink YouTube. Today, we are very fortunate to have with us as our guest, Javier Gutierrez. He is the Secretary of the Presidency of Nicaragua for Climate Change and Vice Minister of Environment and Natural Resources for Nicaragua. He is going to share with us his presentation of Nicaragua's position in the Climate Summit COP26, COP26. Before um, I introduce Minister uh, Gutierrez, I want to give you a little bit of background um, as to what this presentation is about and how it evolved. So um, this year, under the slogan, Uniting the World to Tackle Climate Change, the forthcoming United Nations Climate Change Conference, or COP26, which will be held in Glasgow, UK, from 1 to 12 December 2021, will bring together representatives of some 200 governments with the aim of accelerating climate action to fulfill the Paris Agreement. The presidency of the conference is already working with civil society and business to prepare the annual event and inspire climate action ahead of the event. What is COP or COP? It's the Conference of the Parties or COP is the Supreme Body of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, a treaty that sets out the basic obligations of the 196 states or parties and the European Union to combat climate change. It was signed at the 1992 Earth Summit and came into force in 1994. Since then, a COP has been held every year to review the status of its implementation and to propose, evaluate, and approve other instruments to support its establishment. On 12 December 2015, in the framework of COP21, world leaders approved in Paris a historic agreement to slow down climate change. They committed to keeping the global average temperature increase to well below two degrees centigrade with respect to pre-industrial levels and to work to limit this increase to 1.5 degrees centigrade. They also agreed to intensify efforts to adapt to the impacts of climate change and to make funding flows consistent with the transition to a low carbon economy and climate resilient development. Now, five years after the adoption of the Paris Agreement, climate action has become a key part of recovery plans for the COVID-19 pandemic, a green recovery that creates sustainable jobs and that addresses challenges linked to public health, climate change, and loss of biodiversity in order to protect the environment for future generations. As many of you in the audience may know, Nicaragua did not sign the Paris Agreement because the Ortega government did not believe the accord went far enough, specifically regarding wealthy Northern Hemisphere countries to the detriment of the vulnerable countries of the Global South. This is why we are so very fortunate to hear from Vice Minister Gutierrez today. We're going to hear about Nicaragua's impending proposals at COP26 and how these proposals emphasize the effects of climate change and the necessary response required for Nicaragua and all of Central America. Welcome, Vice Minister Gutierrez. Thank you. First of all, I'm honored to express the greetings and solidarity of our Commander President Daniel Ortega Saavedra and our Vice President, Sister Rosario Murillo. We are at your service. Thank you so much. It's an honor. It's an honor that you accepted our invitation to join us today, and we so look forward to, um, to hearing your presentation. I, I had the honor of listening to you speak last week. It was profoundly informative and important, the information that you have to share. Thank you. We're going to share the presentation now. It's important uh, to highlight that we have decided to call climate crisis to what has been called climate change, because there are several findings in our countries that uh, make us think 
that this is the right way to call this climate crisis. We're going to speak about the position we have defended in international fora, in particular during the COP26 that will take place in Scotland, UK. It's important when we speak about the Paris Agreement to mention some relevant milestones, in particular the Earth Summit that took place in 1992, in which three very important conventions were elaborated. The first one was on climate change, the second on biological diversity, and the third had to do with certification of drugs. This three international instruments had the scope of uh, providing support to our countries to be able to reduce the environmental impacts of these phenomena and to grow on their sustainable development parameters. In 2007, the COP of Bali took place. It was an important event. It became a reference to our past because there, the pillars of the convention were defined. And among other elements, such as mitigation and adaptation, were included technology transfer, capacity building, and the climate long-term financing was defined. So a roadmap was created, the Bali's roadmap, that we have considered as a reference and we always take it into account in everything we do in these matters. Then in 2009, the COP of Copenhagen took place, an event that created a negative landmark in multilateralism and international negotiations because the agreement document had been negotiated months before by developed countries and the developing countries were pushed to go through a very tiring negotiation process. So we can see there that in those agreements back then there was no, not enough uh, commitment by developed countries to reduce their emissions and the countries of ALBA integrated by all of our countries, Venezuela, Nicaragua, Bolivia, back then Ecuador, and the countries of the Caribbean, who are part of ALBA, we all play the key role in order to defend the non-signature of this Copenhagen Agreement. So the Copenhagen Agreement had the intention of weakening the principle of a differentiated responsibility and respective capacities because it was a way for them to evade the historic responsibility. So that's why I say that ALBA played a key role for several countries not to sign this Copenhagen agreement. And that was a dark moment for multilateralism. Then we had a COP that took place in Mexico that somehow rescued the trust that was uh, reduced in Copenhagen and two elements were created, the Green Climate Fund and from that moment in Mexico a roadmap took place to create the set fund and several safeguards were approved to protect the interest of indigenous and Afro-descendant peoples and there was a definition of the actions that countries must implement to tackle climate change. Then the COP of Varsovia took place that was characterized by the approval of the international mechanism of loss and damages that takes into account the challenges that the countries such as Nicaragua are facing, for example, in the case of Nicaragua, there was a loss equivalent to 8% of the gross domestic product, so that's why this mechanism became so important. And then the COP of Paris took uh, place and Nicaragua didn't support the Paris Agreement back then, and I have to highlight this because I was part in the delegation 
We didn't object the Paris Agreement itself. What we expressed is that we were not going to uh, support the agreement because there was a low level of ambition. There was not a clear def defense of the common and differentiated responsibility. There were not enough uh, resources allocated for our countries to tackle climate change. And the mechanisms of indemnity were going to be eliminated in detriment of the country suffering the effects of uh, climate change. We didn't support the Paris Agreement back then, but then we decided to support, yes, based on the Paris Agreement in defense of our interests. Uh, so President Daniel Ortega gave us instructions to support the efforts of the Paris Agreement and then to subsequently adhere the agreement. And then Glasgow's COP is going to take place. This is going to be a very important event. And we hope that this event may allocate enough resources to comply with the previously acquired commitments. And we do hope that there's clear evidence on the commitments and quantifiable goals of developed countries in the reduction of their emissions. We think this is relevant for uh, the whole world, not to reach the 1.5 uh, degrees uh, of increase in temperature, and so that we can develop mechanisms of adaptation and prevention of loss and damages. And the risks that we see in Glasgow have to do with the market approaches, because Due to the lessons we learned from the past, we see that those mechanisms, unfortunately, sometimes favor the non-compliance by developed countries with regards to their domestic emissions. They use these market mechanisms to avoid the responsibilities and the impact of climate uh, change continues. So this is a risk that we foresee, and we're going to pay a lot of attention to this process. By 2023, what we expect is a global assessment, a global balance. This is a, an important moment to uh, review the progress level of the Paris Agreement and take corrective measures. Mm, mainly the Paris Agreement, just to remind you, one of the main objectives is not to increase the average uh, temperature to 1.5 uh, degrees. That's our national uh, position. Even if the Paris Agreement establishes two degrees and it's mentioned that everything possible needs to be made in order to avoid 1.5. And also there are contributions determined for each country and we still see a low level of ambition that is insufficient to reach the necessary goals. And we think this is something very relevant to take into account for this COP26. We don't see that the developed countries uh, must reach their maximum emissions. They should reach this maximum em emissions and start the descent, but we don't see still the peaking we see that the emissions are increasing significantly. And also another important element to mention is the financing for developed countries for adaptation, losses and damages, a sensitive issue for our countries because we are progressively losing economic capacity due to environmental impacts and we don't receive enough support for the mechanisms created within the framework of this uh, convention. And it's important to strengthen transparency mechanisms to see how countries are complying with these uh, commitments of the Paris Agreement. Why do we talk about a climate crisis and not climate change? Well, the ECLAC ECLAC has already recognized four crises that affect developing countries at the world level. One of them is that uh, the planetary thresholds have been reached, and this is overloading the capacity of our ecosystems 
there's a double asymmetry on climate issues. There are countries emitting a lot and others that do not emit anything. And those that do not emit anything are receiving the impact of uh, climate change. So there's inequality in the levels of wealth. So they, there are strong migratory movements due to this inequality. And then we have the COVID-19 pandemic. So these four elements and climate change end up exacerbating these inequality levels and the seriousness of this world crisis. So we understand that the temperature increase is the main factor, the main element, the main variable of climate change, but also we understand that emissions are creating this global warming. This is a scientific proven finding that the emissions increase temperature. We are also clear that the global problem of climate change have a local impact, mainly on vulnerable groups such as women, children, indigenous and rural communities, and the agricultural sector, environment, and forests. These are the main vulnerable groups suffering the environmental impact. We are also seeing that climate inaction will generate greater losses and damages to the economy. And there are remarkable local efforts to uh, face the impact of uh, climate change for also, for us, it's also relevant that with the already existing conditions in our countries, the climate crisis is uh, the main threat against our socioeconomic well-being, elements that are essential for the survival of our families. One of the main reasons for this, and there's a high level of uh, concern, and especially in Nicaragua, we are very concerned. We see that up to this date, the global total emissions are reaching around 59,000 million tons of CO, of equivalent CO2. So all the gases uh, equalized to CO2 and the norm indicates that the planet should not be greater than 14,000 million tons of CO2. So there's an overload in the atmosphere of 45,000 million tons of CO2. So the this is the most serious problem, serious problem that we are facing, and that's why we call upon the UN and the Framework Convention of the United Nations and the United Nations Program on Development. And we call upon all of these uh, programs and institutions for the reduction of this, because this needs to be reduced by 50% by 2030, because otherwise, uh, world temperatures will increase in more than 1.5 degrees. And we see the impact of this in uh, many countries. In many countries, the increase in temperature could be three or four degrees. This is a slide that was uh, recently presented by the United Nations program on the environment that uh, makes us see the situation that we're facing and the countries that have contributed to the increase in temperature due to their emissions. And these uh, countries that produce these emissions must assume their leadership in the reduction of these emissions in at least 50%. Another important finding has to do with the concentration of uh, carbon dioxide in particular and other gases for uh, as of July 21, some days ago, 
the emissions were 416.62 parts per million, a very high concentration. The maximum standard, according to science, should be 320 parts per million. And you can see that to, from the pre-industrial era to our days, the increase has been significant. This is another indicator that even in the presence of the pandemic, we haven't seen a reduction. Instead, we have seen an increase. So this ends up worsening our socioeconomic conditions because there is a high level of losses in our countries. And that's why we need to demand that developed countries should assume their leadership in the reduction of their emissions. This is another example of how the temperature have increased. This is scientific evidence that has uh, been published in several international reports. And in the light of the concentrations we have seen, will, this will cause an increase in temperature. This is also another important piece of evidence how the temperature average increases. And by reviewing historic data, we can see a progressive increase of temperature. Uh, an important finding to say that climate change is a reality. We can see that uh, average is displacing in this uh, plot. So this is a clear evidence that we are in a very dangerous situation of displacement of temperature at a global level. We can see that part of the common but differentiated responsibility principle is based on the fact that there are countries that have very high emissions and we don't see any reduction of their emissions. However, we see also countries that do not produce emissions and are suffering the impact. These are vulnerable countries. So we are defending climate justice because it's in not fair that you have countries that are developing their economies, but their development is inflicting economic losses in the countries that are not emitting anything. This is completely unfair. So that's why there should be a clear responsibility of these developed countries so that they can assume their responsibilities. We also see a climate performance index in developed countries. They are not uh, complying to with uh, what they are expected. So the countries that emit the most have the worst performance. This is another uh, indication of the problem we're facing. Also, we can see here the vulner vulnerability map. Nicaragua is among the countries that are facing the highest risks and we almost do not emit. Our emissions are below 2%. However, we are suffering the impact of the emissions produced by developed countries. We, see, we can see here the quadrant one where you see Nicaragua and other Central American countries. You can see the projections here of the International Convention on Climate Change. It is expected an increase of temperature and an increase in diseases. If we continue to see this trend, the negative effects are going to increase significantly. So what does science tell us about the implementation of the Paris Agreement? One of the main uh, positions we defend is that we need to take science seriously and incorporate the implementation of science in our public policies. 
there are two possibilities with regards to the increase of temperature, an increase of uh, 1.5 degrees by 2050, and it's necessary a reduction. And the other possibility that it has been taken into account in the Paris Agreement is that if measures are taken, the reduction is going to take place in 2075. But we are already suffering the impacts of climate change and there is going to be an acceleration. The new scenarios that we are seeing derived from this increasing temperature are going to take place in the short term. We'll see people having access to less water, suffering drought, you'll see people suffering uh, a reduction in food security, so they're going to have less uh, food. There, there's going to be a worsening of health conditions, mass extinction, more refugees, and according to the United Nations Program for the Environment, if we don't take the necessary measures, we're going to see this increase in temperature of 1.5 degrees by 2025. So in a few weeks, you will see a report published by the ICPCC, and we have received information that uh, confirms what we are mentioning here. In Nicaragua, we also carry out analysis to show, to show our evidence on climate change. We have conducted studies uh, since 1971 up to date, and we have seen an average temperature increase in some places of even 1.7 degrees, and this is worrisome because of the effects in the crops. So many crops are uh, susceptible to these increases in temperature. We have carried out these uh, studies in different uh, climate zones of the country and the trend in the increase of temperature is showing us significant increases that in fact have already affected our population and the productivity level in agriculture. We have also seen a decrease in the precipitation systems. So we see a reduction in precipitation ranges between 12 and 24 percent, which is another clear evidence of the impact of climate change in Nicaragua. With regards to health, we have also conducted models and simulations and we have seen an increase in the cases of diarrhea. So if we have more temperature, we'll see more diarrhea cases. So these uh, create problems in the health sector. A sector is very essential for our population. We also see a correlation between the dengue cases and the precipitation level. This is another element that we are taking into account in our national planning, but also in our local planning. We have also carried out simulation and conducted studies on the increase of diseases when uh, an environmental phenomenon associated to climate change occur. And we see that uh, we have di different uh, increases of respiratory diseases associated to uh, adverse climate phenomena that end up having effects in our health level and in our economy. We have run several uh, cultivation simulations with regards to crops and how they are affected. And these are important elements 
if we take into account uh, the impact of climate change in our country. So our country is severely threatened by phenomena such as floods and increase in the level of the sea because we have a lot of population that uh, lives and works along the coastlines. So especially in our islands and our insular territories, because they carry out uh, tourist activities. But these areas have uh, undergone climate and environmental alterations. Recently, we carried out a study on the losses and damages caused by the hurricanes ETA and IOTA that have inflicted severe damages. Millions of dollars were lost around 8% of the Nicaragua's GDP. However, Nicaragua is moving forward, trying to provide our population with uh, the highest uh, levels of investment, both from the public and private sectors. So we're working to strengthen our institutions and we have a national plan for poverty reduction and human development establishing as one of the main pillars the efforts to tackle climate change. And recently, the National System for Climate Change Management uh, was created to address these issues and integrate the different sectors of the Nicaraguan society to face climate change. That's why all of our commitments within the convention have been developed and we have worked to have a high level of compliance. So all of our national reports have been included within the convention and we are investing in our energy sector, in our agricultural sector, among others, we are working hard with the system of production, trade, and we are working on the technology transfer and widening of capacities. Currently, the, the current status of negotiation, uh, we don't see what are going to be the, what the future brings. We don't see that uh, the $100 billion promise have been fulfilled. We don't see enough uh, efforts and mitigation that we consider that are important. And it's necessary to activate in a clear way the loss and damage mechanisms because they are necessary for our countries. We also need to consolidate the implementation of the nationally determined contributions because for implementation we need the resources and means of implementation. We don't see in the, in the negotiation clear sign of support towards our country. So what does Nicaragua propose? Well, we will continue working with all the progressive regional blocs we will continue to uh, work jointly with the Bolivarian Alliance for the People of our Americas, with the Central American Integration System, SICA, the Community of Latin American and Caribbean Countries, CELAC. Also, from the perspective of the developed countries with the G77 plus China, and we will continue to develop the best decisions for our developing countries. So Nicaragua proposes four pillars that has, have been proposed to the UN. And we have four declarations. One of them has to do with the climate justice, with reparations based on differentiated responsibility. We also have 
uh, spoken about Central America and the Caribbean as a highly vulnerable region to extreme weather event. We also have proposed to elevate losses and damages to the same category of mitigation and adaptation. And we ha have called upon the need uh, and the urgency of preserving and recovering forests as the best protection for our population against the different extreme events. We're going to be reaffirming the mandate of the Mother Earth Summit held in La Paz, Bolivia, last April 2021. We will continue to defend climate justice with reparations as part of the principle of common but differentiated responsibility and respective capacities. We we will continue denouncing the coercive unilateral measures which are illegal and violate international laws and that prevent our countries from uh, tackling climate change. We're going to continue demanding the $100 billion for the Green Climate Fund, which continues to be an unfulfilled promise by the developed countries. We are going to also continue working hard for the, the market mechanism not to uh, replace the real efforts because uh, vulnerable countries need to be protected against climate change. We're going to uh, increase our possibilities so that the losses and damages can be implemented, and this should have been done, but unfortunately political will has uh, not uh, made this possible. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so very much, Minister Gutierrez. What an impressive presentation. It's so uh, really powerful and so helpful while at the same time being, um, you know, pretty, um, pretty alarming how vulnerable Nicaragua is as well as much of Central America and the Caribbean. And um, I wonder if I can ask you um, a few questions before I let you go. Okay. First, uh, okay, que bueno. <laughs> so first, can you uh, tell our audience, two, there's two uh, uh, organizations or uh, that I'd like you to tell us about just for clarification purposes. A, C, C, A, C, so for our audience, ECCAC and GHG emissions, what they are. The, the greenhouse effect gases are comprised by different uh, gases such as carbon dioxide, nitrous, hydrogen, and methane. But the one that is uh, more present in the atmosphere and uh, causing global warming is CO2. That is why the Convention of the UN on Climate Change is prioritizing CO2, but the rest of uh, gases such as methane, nitrous oxide, uh, we try to include them in one unit called COT. That's why we speak about equivalent CO2. So we make an equivalence between the CO2 with the other gases, creating the greenhouse effect and global warming. So when we speak about CO, equivalent CO2, we need to understand that all the gases have been uh, combined in one unit. It's a little technical, but this is a language that is recognized during negotiations and in the instrument, which help us to make an inventory of the greenhouse effect. This, this acronym is in English, so it makes reference to greenhouse effect gases. 
Okay, thank you so much. Um, gosh, I'm thinking um, of about five things all at once here. So let me, um, let's talk a little bit about um, increased precipitation, hurricane specifically, which will affect the Caribbean coast of Nicaragua, which is where you mentioned the islands are. And I had the honor of visiting um, Corn Island in March when I was in your country, I was there for a month. Um, we brought a delegation of 14 people uh, to study um, the early sanctions regime against Nicaragua imposed by the United States. And so in the chart that there was, oh, I forget the actual number of the chart, but it showed regarding inundacion or hurricanes and flooding, Honduras, Nicaragua, Haiti, Dominican Republic, I'm not sure if I saw Cuba on that chart or not, but these are clearly countries all living in uh, along the, close to the equator and specifically in the Caribbean. Can we talk about how the increase in precipitation is um, creating mosquito-borne illnesses, dengue, you specifically mentioned, and also how the imposition of unilateral coercive measures, as they're formerly known, many of our audience will refer to them as economic sanctions. They're unilateral because they're imposed solely by the United States. Again, so there's an early sanctions regime against Nicaragua with the Nicaragua, with the NICA Act, but more being developed through the Renaissance Act um, in the US Congress and Senate right now. And also 60 plus years of sanctions against Cuba. So I wonder if you can specifically talk to us about how a sanctions regime imposed by the United States is inhibiting Nicaragua's response to climate change. First of all, these uh unilateral coercive measures are completely illegal. The, they are not sanctions because sanctions are established by the UN. In the case of measures, these are unilateral and against international law. So starting from this point, we need to understand that this uh, is a completely illegitimate mechanism. However, due to the influence uh, that the capital exercises, in the international community and the expression of international capitalism, there uh, have been uh, actions taken uh, against Nicaragua to prevent financing, to prevent access from Nicaragua to funds from the International Development Bank, among others. So we have suffered interruptions in negotiation process that Nicaragua had to access financing. And even if Nicaragua has executed and used successfully the funds provided by the World Bank and the International Develop, uh, Bank, Development Bank, and this has been uh, mentioned by this institution in several spaces. However, due to these unilateral coercive measures, we have been blocked. We have been blocked by the United States in uh, programs that are oriented to reduce poverty, to address climate change. So clearly this is an aggression against the right to life. So this is a double-edged diplomacy. Uh, we sp speak about climate change in diplomatic fora but then the access is interrupted to the funds. So this is an injustice against the indigenous people in Nicaragua, against the rural people of Nicaragua. So we are clearly affected. We are clearly affected in the access and mobilization of resources. However, Nicaragua also has access to uh, solidarity, international aid, and due to our uh, transparent uh, uh, use of the national budget, we continue to work 
to have uh, access to funds and conduct actions to increase productivity, to improve the position of Nicaragua in markets, and to increase the level of confidence of our clients internationally. And we try to take our products to international markets. This from the point of view of unilateral sanctions. Now, with regards to precipitation, the Caribbean is completely affected by the increase of the precipitation level. The ambassador knows well the sun and our Afro-descendant population and indigenous population and so affected. We, uh, we have constant rain in these areas. However, a reduction in precipitation levels is going clearly to affect the development of ecosystem. The tropical forest requires rain to continue uh, being healthy. The Caribbean coast is the place where we have the best uh, uh, type of water. We have uh, rivers and our indigenous population there use natural resources to be able to live and survive in a sustainable manner. An example of sustainability and the preservation of forests is what the indigenous people do there because they have an ancestral and responsible management of these resources and we are learning from this indigenous population uh, and that is why all the environmental and sustainable practices taking place in Nicaragua are based on the knowledge shared by the indigenous population with us. So when we see a reduction in precipitations, we'll see forests that uh, change their conditions and we start to see a process of degradation and this has an impact in the services for the indigenous population. And then you have the problem of the increase of diseases, the effects on food security, and that is why we have a launched a warning and we are warning about the impacts and we're working to minimize the impact uh, in our population. Thank you so much. I think one of the one of the biggest adaptations I've seen personally witnessed in your country is is food sovereignty. The grow Nicaragua grows ninety five percent or produces ninety five percent of the food that it consumes, which. Um, to, to, in my experience being in your country, I would say twi twice I've, I've seen um, activity specific to food sovereignty. One, uh, when I was visiting your country in summer of 2014 on a delegation uh, with Alliance for Global Justice actually, was a climate change theme specifically studying um, the different programs and practices of, of Nicaragua uh, as far as recognizing and adapting to climate change. And then specifically being there in March of th this year, um, studying food sovereignty and many other um, projects that Nicaragua has that are kind of um, helping you remain sovereign against this sanctions regime imposed by the United States. But the food sovereignty is such a huge, huge issue in um, combating climate change and maintaining national sovereignty. And I wonder if you can address this expansion of what many in the audience would know as the dry corridor in Central America. It's affecting more than just Nicaragua or parts of Nicaragua, a good part of Honduras and up uh, to Mexico as well. And how that dry corridor is affecting food sovereignty and migration because climate change is often not discussed in the United States relative to um, migration or as an impact on migration. Yes, there's a discussion whether we're talking about a dry quadrant. When we, when we see the aquifers, the underground water, we see that we have conditions, we have uh, access to underground water when we are compared to really dry zones. So there's a whole discussion 
about uh, the fact that we need to improve our technology and the mechanisms to be able to guarantee uh, the access of sufficient uh, water to, for production and but we have what we have called the dry corridor we have something that we call the dry corridor which is a geographical zone in the country characterized by having uh, an inferior precipitation regime compared to other zones of Nicaragua in the north or other places in the Caribbean. This situation of low precipitation level, what is uh, causing us is to pay attention to the issue of technology and technology transfer so that we can increase our capacity to uh, also work locally with uh, the communities, with the uh, farmers, with those who, who produce, so that they can use uh, a technology to establish certain areas for what we have called the water development, so that we can have techniques to produce water, to store water, to collect water, and mainly in these zones. Even if we have a dry corridor in these zones, there are times in which we have rain, precipitation, so we can develop techniques to collect this water during those seasons and be able to use this water for productivity. Also, the programs and projects that involve prioritizing this area to uh, foster the access to technology, and that is why uh, our National Institute of Agrarian Technology is putting a remarkable effort and developing a local network to uh, design certain activities to guarantee the access uh, to water so that we can uh, provide uh, with water to our population that has difficulties to have access to it. So what I want to make clear that is that in terms of hydric capacity in the area that is called the dry area, it, it's, it has abundant hydric resources, but we need to reinforce technology so that we can uh, guarantee the access to water for human development. So Nicaragua has very specialized institution in this topic, like the FISE and the ANA, the Fund of National Investment uh, and Emergency and the National Institution for Water Access, they are focusing on working at a local level to guarantee the access to water by the population. We also have the Ministry of Environment that is uh, protecting the hydrographic basins so that uh, a proper environmental management takes place so that there is a, an appropriate supply level so that uh, access to water is guaranteed to our population. So as you can see, we have several mechanisms for this purpose, but we are deeply concerned due to climate change because uh, the, the droughts are going to increase due to climate change. So there is going to be an exacerbation of the current problems and we may face a negative scenario in terms of water supply and productivity. That is why we are emphasizing in the necessity of preventive actions as we saw in the slides, we need to prevent uh, the increase of temperature and we can also foresee an extreme phenomenon that may affect uh, our communities, such as the one we experienced last week in one of our regions in Chantales, Santo Tomas, where there was a, a there were flooding due to a collapse of the hydrographic basin. So that's why we are calling. Uh, upon the review of the northern area of Nicaragua, seeing how can we uh, take corrective measures 
to prevent these type of collapses that end up affecting the lower part uh, of the basin. So for our audience, I think it's really, really important for uh, people to understand that Nicaragua has the largest landmass in Central America. It stretches from the Pacific Ocean to the Caribbean. So it has two coastlines that are going to be affected by rising sea level. And as Minister uh, Gutierrez has explained on the Caribbean coast, there is increased hurricane activity, increased flooding, and then, and then the country is large enough also to have a dry corridor area. So it's really, really important for all of us to understand the vulnerabilities of Nicaragua and other countries of Central America as well, including Honduras, Costa Rica. It's, um, it's really, really impressive, the program and response that Nicaragua has implemented for, him, for itself, but is also um, calling upon and will introduce at COP26. I wonder, is there anything in closing, Minister Acosta, that you would like, like to add? Yes, what you just mentioned, the first defense front that we have, and that's why we have raised our voice with regards to the protection of the forest, the first barrier that we face, ah, the first barrier that protects us are the mangroves, the forests. And that is why it's so important that these forests are preserved so that they continue to be the main defense of our population and those that have uh, degraded can be restored. But this doesn't take place overnight and without resources. Resources are necessary because preservation requires resources. And these are uh, defense mechanisms that we need to uh, reinforce against problems that we are, we are not responsible for. Climate change uh, is produced by the 10 largest economies of the world that are creating 59,000 tons of CO2 and the effects are suffered by our country. So the, co the call we are making is that we need to reflect and take the necessary measures so that developed countries need to lead these efforts in the reduction of emissions so that our countries do not continue suffering the impacts derived from the contamination against our planet. Thank you. Thank you so much. What an honor to have you as our guest, guest today. Your presentation has been profoundly um, informative and um, I really, I really hope it makes such a huge impact in Glasgow in November because it's so important what you have to share and so crucial to, uh, to the survival of the people of Nicaragua. But many, many countries around the globe, especially those um, living uh, along the equator. Um, so I want to remind um, our audience you've been listening to or watching What the F is Going On in Latin America, Code Pink's weekly YouTube program of hot news out of Latin America and the Caribbean. We broadcast every Wednesday at 4.30 p.m. Pacific, 7.30 p.m. Eastern on Code Pink's YouTube channel. Also, be sure uh, to listen to Code Pink Radio every Thursday, 11 a.m. Eastern, 8 a.m. Pacific, broadcast simultaneously on um, WBAI out of New York City and WPFW out of Washington, D.C. You can also uh, find the radio on Apple Podcasts and Spotify, too, I believe. So thank you again, uh, Minister Gutierrez. Su such an honor uh, to have you with us today. And I'm so thankful for the information that you shared with all of us. And everybody, we'll see you next week. Let's see. Thank you so much.